belongs to. And I, ideally, when you click on that number, it'll take you to the museum's database for that specimen. And, and GenBank has created these collection codes because they realize uh, at Smithsonian, US, and M, there may be the same number for a bird, a fish, a frog. So they have to create these collection codes to distinguish which collection it came from. And um, I presented a similar talk at the spinach meetings. This is my first Hadwig, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there was some discussion about these collection codes aren't unique, but GenBank has a way of um, making them unique. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, here's an example of the Smithsonian and all the various collection codes they have registered in GenBank. Now, this is only in GenBank. Um, here is an example of the MFN, and I've recently curated the collection codes that they had, and they are still lacking some, so we need to add some. But um, this is they can get around making the codes unique by adding the three-letter country code which they've done for MFN uh, because there was already an MFN in their database. And the collection codes and institution codes can also have synonyms. So for instance, I don't know if you noticed, but Smithsonian has USNM and NMNH was a synonym and MFN um, most typically uses ZMB historically. And so the vast majority of their specimens have that institution code, but MFN exists and um, ZMHU for the uh, Humboldt University. But again, these are only in GenBank, these institution codes and collection codes. And so uh, this brings to mind, maybe we need a collection code database for other aggregate search engines like GBIF and GGBN. So in GenBank, there's also a variety of source modifiers you can apply to sequence data. And so collection date, country, um, you can indicate if it's type material or not. Uh, and then you have um, ecotype, haplotype, specimen voucher is where the voucher information should go, but now not everybody puts it in the right place. <laughs> there's also a field for isolate, which can refer to the DNA isolated from that specimen voucher, which often people put the um, specimen voucher in the isolate field. And then there's also a biomaterial field, which is um, was new to me, actually, this summer, not even knowing that existed. But it seems that that is meant for um, samples that don't come from a voucher. So if it's from a zoo or a um, seed bank, but there's no um, voucher. But there's, there's very little um, agreeance on this, and there's very little enforcement of putting these uh, fields in the right, putting the codes in the right field. And not a lot of people are aware of all these different options. And so um, another problem with this is that a lot of institutions are, or some institutions or some collections are using the, the URI or a digital identifier in, instead of a, uh, actual specimen voucher or a collection catalog number, particularly in collections of insects where ha they have hundreds of thousands and they're, they, they simply just don't wanna put a catalog number and immediately put a NURI or a URI on that. They say, you know, can't we just use that? But the problem with that is that that can create um, confusion and make things look like different specimens when it's actually from the same specimen. And Smithsonian also their entomology collection, they'll assign um, a different catalog number from the same series. So USNM ENT for an insect, if they pluck its leg off, it gets a new number. And if they extract DNA, it gets a third number, all from the same series, but all referring to the same specimen. And so that could create confusion where researchers down the road, five or 10 years later, see that number and they say oh it's different from this published one so that's a different specimen so i want to sequence it and compare it and so um, that creates a lot of confusion one way to get in and GenBank will accept those uris after the collection code so they want institution code collection code and then you can have a uri a, a nuri or a, a doi number um, and, and one way around avoiding the duplicate is to use the same modifier and just add an extension to it, like 
leg or DNA or tissue at the end of that code. So this is my last slide. And I just wanna raise these issues that, um, you know, the multiple URIs for one specimen creates a lot of confusion. We have tissue, DNA, images, et cetera. It may lead people to think it's a different specimen when it's coming from the same specimen. And um, some other issues that were brought to my attention when I presented this were that um, now that GBIF includes bold and uh, EMBL records, there are a lot of duplications of the same specimen. So you'll you'll search on a taxon and you'll get hits for the barcode, the sequence, you know, all of these things and the voucher specimen. So it's it's really inflating the number of records in bold for the actual number of specimens that are attached to those records. And GGBN, uh, the GBIF of tissues will list all of the tissue, the DNA, and the specimen. So three or five to the same uh, specimen. And so that's all. I'll take any questions if there's time or I can wait for the discussion. Thanks very much, Dan. And I think we will wait. Okay. Martin, you're up. You can thank us, those who are leading symposia later in the week, that we are working out all the bugs right now. It's sweet. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, here to present to you the Disco Flanders project. Uh, I'm Martin from Massa Botanic Garden, and I'm coordinating this project. And I'm happy here as a coordinator to present this, but this is a work not from me, but from a whole team of people. So I already thank them in advance. Um, what is Disco Flanders? Disco Flanders is uh, trying to make. Uh, collection management within a, a region, this is the Flemish region within Belgium, a bit more streamlined and try to make it relevant in, uh, in the international uh, community. A little map of uh, Belgium. What are we uh, talking about uh, within Disco Flanders? Disco Flanders is actually uh, consisting of 14 partners, uh, which, of which 10 of them are funded, which are Flemish collections. And then four of them are federal partners, are associated partners, so we can collaborate them uh, with them to on uh, all kind of uh, collection-based uh, problems. What kind of collections are we talking about? It's a wide variety of collections. Uh, we have Mass Botanic Garden with a with a four million uh, specimen herbarium, which is something is an institution which is really built around this collection, um, and. Really, the core business is collection management. But we also have uh, the universities involved, some other research organizations which don't really have collection management within their DNA. So these are, uh, they all have collections, but they are not always curated as well as uh, the institutions that are really focused on collection management. And you can see a couple of pictures, nice pictures. On the left, we have uh, 
top left, uh, the zoo of Antwerp, uh, which has a, a nice uh, biobank, uh, which is collecting uh, samples from all the living animals. And it's a living collection, an animal, living animal collection. The Zoological uh, Museum in Leuven of the university, and then the Ghent University Museum on the, on the bottom. What are we trying to do within Disco Flanders? And I summarize it within four pillars. First, we want to inventory these collections and assess them. What is exactly within these collections? What can we find? What can we expect? Um, and in what kind of state are they? Are they well curated, not so well curated? How much mold is there on the specimens? These kind of things. Then in a the second pillar, we are actually looking at best practices and guidelines. And I, I think in within Disco Flanders, this is one of the main things we are going to do is try to see how we uh, can optimize curation of these collections. Where do we uh, uh, want to have standard operation procedures in place? Um, how are we dealing with legal aspects of collections? This is a, a very important uh, aspect of Disco Flanders. A third one is around infrastructure, because to manage collections, you need a collection management system. So basically, uh, we are trying to guide all these partners within collection management systems, try to help them, try to collaborate together to come to a, a common understanding on how we have to do uh, collection management within these institutions. And then a, a fourth one, and that's very nice because we have also the universities involved, is how are we going to use this data and how are we going to share this data? Within Disco Flanders, we do have time that we can work on data standards. We are here at TEDWIC, of course. Uh, but we also have the universities looking at the specimens, at images of specimens that are taken. How can we enrich information on these specimens using novel techniques? Uh, how can we uh, use uh, machine learning, for example, to get more information out of our, our specimens? And these are uh, aspects that our, our universities can help uh, with that. And that's all surrounded with the help desk functionality. So within this consortium, we try to help each other. We try, we have implemented uh, a sort of help desk functionality to help each other within the consortium, but also maybe to help external people that want to learn from us. I already told you, it's a variety of collections. We have the preserved collections. And like I, I you, you can imagine, the, the, project is called Disco Flanders, so we are very well connected with Disco, and Disco is really looking already very deep into these preserved collections, but we also have an association of uh, botanical gardens and arboreta within, ons, within our consortium. So basically, we also have a very big botanical uh, living collection. We also have a big zoological living collection. But those are a bit separately because they are managing already globally in, in the one united system. But how can we interlink our preserved collections with their uh, system? We have seed banks within uh, Disco Flanders. So basically, we have a whole range of, of things. Then we don't only have biological um, uh, collections. There is a whole bunch of mineralogical uh, samples within our collections. There are soil samples, uh, there, are, there are eDNA samples. So there is, there is a really wide variety of things that we are, have to manage within the Disco Flanders um, uh, project. Then I already mentioned it before, there are the collections which are very well curated and then other collections, and I call them here research collections. It's not really research collections as such, but these are collections that are mainly curated often by volunteers or by a PhD student or by a postdoc that does that in his weekends. So not every collection within this consortium is uh, can be happy to have full-time staff available for their collections. So basically also the system need to be able, or our consortium, the way our consortium works, need to be able to handle uh, how much staff there is available. Sometimes there, is, there needs to be done a very quick transport from one PhD student to another, from one postdoc to another. So it needs to be 
very intuitive to, uh, to people. And we can think of a whole range of other um, things that are varying between uh, those collections. And I'm happy that we had already a couple of speakers uh, before me that are already showed something similar, but I want to highlight a few things which are, can be special. There is, and I have two cases to just show a little bit how, how different it can be. This, <coughs> sorry, this one is uh, the very typical collecting event. Someone goes into the field and collects a specimen. The ideal case is that after he, that person, that researcher goes into the field and collects his specimens, that he access and accessions it into the collection management system. So instead of going the straight line on the, on the top, he first makes a specimen out of his collection and only then does research or do, does a DNA extract and then uh, stores that DNA extract. Why? Because if you want to have a identifier or some identify your specimen, you need that connection or you need to at least deposit your specimen somewhere in a collection. But this is obviously not always the case. For many different reasons, one of the, uh, the, the most hurt reasons why you go directly from a collection to extracting DNA is oh, if we have to access in the specimen, specimen, this takes too much time. And then my research gets delayed and so on and so on. So basically in many cases, if we are lucky, the specimen do gets into the collections, but we have to backtrace from the DNA extract to the specimen because there is maybe some ad hoc code written on the specimen and then we have to know back, oh, it was that specimen and we accessed it under that number. So that's one of the issues we have to deal with. That's an important one. After the DNA extract is made, there is a choice to store it or not store it, store it for a long term or short term. So we have to make, accommodate all these, uh, all these kind of cases within uh, the, uh, within the school flounders. In the, in the ideal case that we do have a specimen, afterwards there is still other stuff that can happen with the specimen. If we are talking about musea, the specimen can be on display, so we have to track uh, where the specimens are. It can go into storage under certain conditions, and we have to monitor these con conditions, make sure that the specimens are um, well curated. And then there is also additional research that can be, can be done on that specimen. That research that's done on the specimen can update everything we know about the specimen. So basically the specimens get identified, the researchers come in, and he says, well, okay, it's not that uh, species, it's something else. It's something new, it's something which is misidentified. So all of these things we also need to track within uh, the collection management. And then there is the special dotted line. Actually with this living collections, there is a, we can have an accession or a specimen, a living specimen, and that specimen can reproduce. It can make uh, seedlings and there can be everything which is done on the initial specimen can also be done on the next generations of specimens grown from these living specimens. So we also need to backtrace everything back to the original collection. So this is an additional uh, layer of uh, complexity within the living collections. This is a nice case of where you start off of a collection and you build a whole web of specimens around it. The other case I want to present is actually doing some history because many of these specimens which are in the university collections, well, they might have something to identify uh, the specimen, often just a number, but not really the event where it was collected. So basically, uh, I have here one example of uh, a professor of the K Leuven, the University of Leuven, and he acquired and collected quite a lot of specimens. He bought collections from other people, then sold them again. Uh, and all the information about these collections are often in books, in lab notes. And the only thing you know on the specimen is one single number. Moreover, it's a, uh, I'm almost there. 
Moreover, the collection uh, is a very typical Belgian case. It was acquired, it was a nice single collection, but then the states uh, decided to split up. So basically all the collections were split up. So we also have to backtrace all these specimens back to this one collection built by Henri de Dorlodeau. So that's another uh, use case of where we need good collection management and have something to store all this information to make one single collection again of the split up collection. And with that, I come to the end of my talk. And since I, I already said, it's not only my work, we are a consortium, there are a lot of people to thank. And what I wanted to do here is just to initiate some discussion. And so please come to me if you want to know more. I also need to uh, acknowledge our funding agency, the Flemish Research Foundation for getting uh, funding for Disco Flanders. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Martin. And uh, we are a little bit over time. Sorry about cutting into your lunch, just a minute or two. But uh, we will uh, come back together again at 4.30. So there's a set of sessions after the lunch. And then we are the last session of the day. And again, we'll have 45 minutes of time for questions and discussion. So write down whatever it was that's in your brain right now. Thank you. we're correct it is 3m so it's on the third floor it's it's a place called m which is where those of us who are here have breakfast but i believe that's where we're going for lunch <laughs>